moved my studio from Tribeca to the Kiwanis neighborhood of Brooklyn a few years ago. It's an industrial neighborhood. It's filled with small manufacturers. Some people live here, but down right on these particular blocks, it's almost completely industrial. I've never really had such a great studio, and um, it was an incredibly good deal. And I said to the guy on the phone, is this in the basement? He went, no, it's got 12 windows. I said, I said, I'll be right over. So I came over and I took it. I gave myself optimum situation to make big, colorful paintings. I've never had North Light before, and it is everything they, that it's cracked up to be. It's just phenomenal to paint with North Light. It's the evenness during the day. It's the fact that it doesn't change. And I knew when I was starting this work, they were going to be good old-fashioned paintings. And it's really cool to be working with North Light, making good old-fashioned paintings. I saw the piece in the current Brooklyn work show. I would never have guessed that it was by Deb Cass. These text pieces are a complete change from what she was doing before. It's almost as if she went into hibernation for a while, I didn't see work for a while, and then all of a sudden there's this brash, bright painting. When I teach, I always say to my kids, you gotta do what you love, you gotta paint what you love, you gotta make what you love or what you hate, but you gotta talk about something that's urgent. And this stuff originated with the lyrics from Broadway musicals. Basically, I sat in that corner for a year and uh, did these works on paper. The first one I made, this very first one, Sing Out Louise. Here's another Sing Out Louise from maybe a month later. And at that was the point when they started looking like paintings. I started thinking about Louises in the art world because there's so many great Louises in the art world. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to have a Louise suite of paintings? A woman has no place in the art world unless she proves over and over again she won't be eliminated. And that's a Louise Bush walk quote. I've known Debbie for a long time, you know, 22, 23 years. And it's very much the reverse of her practice for two decades. Artists usually begin their work with drawing, with watercolors, with small, intimate studies on paper, and then they build up. Deborah Cass is the anomaly. She just starts on a canvas. That was my experience at the beginning. So it was really startling to walk into her studio last year and find the studio filled with small, bright works on paper, watercolors, drawings. And it was so fun and such a surprise. Oh wait, here's another one from Gypsy. Do something special. There's a really a lot of these. There's 75 or 100 of them. They're very disarming the images, highly photogenic. Her works have appeared God knows how many times in art magazines, in culture magazines, and in the New York Times, in fact. The most recent exhibition we present here at the Brooklyn Museum is Open House Working in Brooklyn. It's a large exhibition which contains over 300 works. And one of them is by Debra Kass, which is a painting to my left. And Debra is referring to sort of popular culture and the songs from the musical Hairspray, but also to the modernist tradition of the Mondrian's painting. She uses the colors which would have been used by Mondrian and the shapes which would have been used by Mondrian. 
for me has always it's just never been a focus of mine. That's not to say I'm not interested in other people's styles. I am. Clearly, I use them. Like in the new work, it's really important that they each look different from each other, just so I continue my unrelationship with style. I took myself to the Art Students League when I was 14 and started taking classes. And my parents were really, really against it. And I babysat and made my own money and did it. I mean, they didn't disallow me, but they weren't going to encourage it in any way. What I would do is I'd go into these morning classes at 9, and I'd schlep in from Long Island with my portfolio and blah, blah, blah. And I, you know, and I would do the model and learn how to draw knees and a lot of eye-hand coordination stuff. And you know, I was good at it. I loved it. And then in the afternoon, I'd go to MoMA. I mean, I remember doing a Rauschenberg combine in my basement with our ratty old ping pong table and dartboard. You know, I mean, it's just like I knew about Rauschenberg. I was really interested in this. And, you know, I would be walking around looking at Mark Rothko's going, you know, a little too serious for me. You know, a little too deep, a little too religious, not my thing. But my first real big, you know, I can really do this was the Frank Stella retrospective. I believe it was 1970. I was already on my way to art school. I mean, I already was applying and stuff, but going through Frank Stella's series of work, I absolutely understood formally how he made the jump between every, you know, between the stripe paintings to the protractors to the Polish synagogues. You know, it was very obvious to me what formal decisions he was making and the jumps he was making. That was my final affirmation. You are absolutely going to do this because you understand how this artist thought. You didn't need money to be an artist in those days. You could just do it on ambition and perseverance. And I sort of look up and go, God, I haven't had a real job in 25 years. It's kind of amazing. I was a waitress at Broom Street Bar, and I made, I can't remember, it was $13,000 a year or $19,000 a year. In 1978, I could rent a house in the Hamptons, I had a car, and I worked three days a week, and I could make my work. It was, I was like loaded. Deborah Cass is an artist who came of age in the 1980s, and I think in an art world where identity was considered monolithic, you were either an African American, a lesbian, or a woman. You couldn't be all three, and Deborah's work helped reshape the complexity of identity for art historians and the art world. Deborah's done sort of two major bodies of work. One has been about powerful landscapes, making landscape almost figurative. It's almost as though rocks and waves have become wrestlers, dancers. They're incredibly powerful works. Rocks and water, that seemed to be my thing. And except for one painting, none of them had a horizon line. They were all very frontal. They were kind of off kilter and there's a lot of action and the viewer was very implicated in the action of the painting because there was no perspective, there was no horizon, there was no way to contextualize the painting with other than as a viewer. When I changed the work, the change was really conscious, and it was, what if I take nature out? What's left? Basically, it was me and art history. I started to juxtapose different images in art history. Her work is a serious part of the appropriation movements of the late 80s and early 90s in which artists reframed artistic images and strategies that came out of a trajectory of modern art that goes from Duchamp to Warhol. And those paintings really address my absence in art history as a woman. And some of them deal directly with the images of women in art history. Like for instance, How Do I Look? Which was the images I could find of lesbians in art history. The two I could find. <laughs> One being Corbet Sleepers and Picasso's Gertrude Stein.
I was trying pretty much to deal with heavy, you know, the big boys, and so Picasso, Pollock, and David Sally, which definitely ruffled some feathers, but I thought it was a really pretty good tribute, considering he was placed next to Cezanne and Charles Schultz. Charles Schultz was a hero of mine when I was really little, and I used to write to him. And I used to send him drawings and my cartoon strips. I have these great letters saying your drawings are coming along nicely, and you know, very encouraging. They had a website that you could write to Charles Schultz when he was sick and dying of cancer. And I wrote this letter to him. I'm, I'm sure he was, I'm sure he got thousands. I'm sure he didn't read it. But it was basically like I have the Snoopy that he drew me in my studio in New York where I have been a, an artist for 25 years. And, you know, his encouragement really helped. So I started using the Lucy body because, of course, I related to Lucy the most. Actually, that's not true. I probably related to Linus the most because I had a blanket till I was really old, like 17, 18. Um, and Schroeder because he was like the space case. But, you know, I think people related me to Lucy more than I related to Lucy. But anyway, Lucy started to be used in these paintings. The armless, voiceless Lucy. So the art history paintings led directly to the Warhol series. It was sort of thinking about my presence and my adolescence, and I'm going, wait a minute, wait a minute, Barbara. And I, it all sort of gelled into this, like, my God, when I was 12. Barbara Streisand had hit on the scene, and I remember going completely gaga over this Jewish girl from Brooklyn making it big. People like my parents couldn't stand her because she was too Jewish. And for assimilating Jews of that generation, Barbara's self-love and understanding of her own glamour was utterly subversive. She wouldn't change her name, she wouldn't change her nose. She was just so self-empowered. It was astounding. And it was exactly these qualities that brought me to Barbara Streisand as a 12 or 13 year old. And it was exactly those qualities that I wanted in myself. So using Barbara for me was utterly autobiographical. It was utterly revealing. It was coming out as a Barbara Streisand fan was way more embarrassing than coming out as a lesbian. And to walk into a room fill, filled with images of Barbara Streisand was, it was wild. blew my mind and that was the beginning of this landmark series for 10 years of work by Deborah Cass that has been seen in museums and galleries around the world. We're in front of Deborah Cass's Double Red Yentl Split. It's a work we purchased shortly after the exhibition to Jewish, which was in part inspired by Deborah Cass's work and my many conversations with Deborah on the missing Jewish identity within the multicultural framework of that period of art making. It's so joyous and so, so much about pop culture, but so much about um, where the Jew fits in pop culture. As opposed to the gun-toting Elvis of Warhol fame, here we have beautifully silk-screened Barbara Streisand in the role of Yentl, where she's actually cross-dressing as a male Talmudic student so that she would have the possibility as a woman, as a Jewish woman, um, of an education. I knew I was hitting three major targets. Homosexuals, women, and Jews. And it was the, the height of the multicultural moment in the late 80s. And queer artists, black artists, women artists were definitely part of that mix. Jews were the glaring omission to me. And with this Barbara stuff, the minute I did it, I was like, oh my god, I've just hit all my marks. 
artists look at our history, previous generations' history, and make it their own. That's essentially what appropriation is. And Deborah Cass, admiring Andy Warhol, decided to create this body of work in homage to Andy Warhol and also taking his style and his motifs. Just as Andy Warhol had admired American industry and marketing and taken Campbell Soups cans. In the early 90s, when I first saw Deb's work, it had this appropriation of Andy Warhol in it. But it clearly had a subject matter that was extremely personal and very much related to the artist herself. She was exploring what it is to be Deborah Cass, what it is to be a woman in the society, what it is to be a female artist, and using Andy Warhol's positions, his paintings, his colors, he really took that form and made it her own. After the Entels and the Barbers, I realized I wasn't done with Andy. So the first person I took on was Gertrude Stein. For one thing, I believe she invented the modernist idea of repetition. A rose is a rose is a rose. And let's face it, she was a big old lesbian who collected art and one of the first generation of important Jewish collectors of contemporary art. So the first thing I did was this series of paintings called Chairman Ma that were all of Gertrude Stein done a la Chairman Mao. And then that led to Parisian Portrait of Gertrude Stein, Let Us Now Praise Famous Women, and The Family Stein. And they are based on Andy's paintings of Robert Rauschenberg and his family. I did Cindy Sherman as Liza Minnelli. She was amazing. I mean, I called her and she said, do you want me to come now? I did Norman Clayblatt, and I thought like having Norman, the curator of the Jewish Museum, as this hot, semi-naked guy was like fabulous, came out great. I did a portrait of Elizabeth Murray, and I did a orange disaster, which is a 10-foot painting of Linda Nochlin as a car crash, basically, which she was kind of for art history in the best possible way. But I think of all of those, probably the most successful of the next gang of paintings was probably all the self-portraits. So I have a 24-panel one called Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, and it's my hair pulled back and the very famous, you know, Andy pose. Same size as Andy's. All of them are generally the same size as Andy's paintings and the photo ones, which was actually the Christopher Makos photo of Andy in drag. So it's me in drag and drag. The last of the self-portraits was in 2000, and it was me as Liz Taylor, and it was the first one of me not as Andy. Silver Deb, Blue Deb. It was really fun to do, four hours of hair and makeup. It was really, really, really fun. You know, this was this big transition from the Warhol stuff to a completely different body of work. The question was how to do what I always do in a different way or how to do what I've done in a few ways in yet another new way. This afternoon I have Jim Cottrell coming with curator Sue Scott. Jim's a collector of mine who was actually a friend first, which is unusual because the other collectors who I consider very close friends really came through my work. They are coming over to see the new work and talk about it. And I'm really excited because Jim's a real painting person. And I've been telling him he's going to really go for this because it's so much about painting. Guess what I got? What? Saltwater taffy from Sacramento. Oh, yum. 
It's always going to be a problem for artists who want to make a change. It's always tough because suddenly their art doesn't look the way it's always looked. And I think Deb's work in particular had a certain kind of commercial sheen. She had adopted this Andy Warhol look. She became known for this kind of Andy Warhol look. I think it's an admirable thing to get tired of doing something the same way for too long. And that it's a brave thing. It's the bravest thing an artist can do. Oh, oh wow. Oh, look at this. Wow. I love this one. I love this one. Yeah, this is really great. I like the color. There's a little bit of everything in this. Exactly. Like, yeah. That's great. This is going to Denise this week. Is this? Yeah, this is in a show that's opening Wednesday. Uh -huh. yeah. This is It's Hard to Be a Jew in Yiddish. Uh -huh. A personal favorite for me was the one that in Yiddish reads, It's Tough to Be a Jew. Just the way it's painted with those big fleshy letters and it's kind of in your face, loud. and. I feel that for that painting to come up on a wall today is a radical act. Maybe it couldn't have even happened 10 years ago, but right now I feel like that is a brave work to make. This, is, this lettering reminds me of the, kind of the flower power days. When you, when you were little, didn't you, wouldn't you write out like the big puffy letters, flower power? Yes, and yes, and yes, kind of like yes. Kind of this is very high school, junior, yeah. junior yeah. high school. Yeah. Yeah. What's up with this? I don't know what's up That's with that. Wow. What do That's you mean? That's really amazing, huh? That's the back. Yeah. And see, it's got a little hole there that I taped on here. I don't know how I ended up doing This was the pattern for that. I think I cut these shapes out. Oh, I know why, because I didn't have, uh, I took slides of all those smaller things and how I made the paintings was literally just to project them and draw them onto the canvas, but this one I didn't have because the grammar and everything was wrong in that watercolor. So I guess I did a small line drawing and blew it up to the right size. All the work I did before up to now, I kind of had to do because I felt someone had to do it. Like, someone had to do this Warhol thing and I was the person to do it. Someone had to do those art history paintings and I was the person to do it. These are like what I want to do. How does Warhol fit into this? It has to be a psychological reference to the new paintings because I don't see any sort of images of the Warhols. There couldn't be because it's a completely different series. Uh -huh. I can't refer back to that work. Uh -huh. It's kind of a thing in and of itself. But the idea is similar. Well, the ideas, I think, are similar to everything I've ever done, right. you know? Thread. Yeah. What, what Which is, is that thread? That my relationship to art history is always one of the subjects of the work. So with this painting, did you make this in one day, two days, or did you make it while working on other paintings? Uh... I basically have five or six going at the same time, and I started them a year ago now, like in May, okay, the whole thing. And there are little corrections still that I'm making. This painting has had this piece of tape on it for months, and I haven't gotten around yet to putting this one blue dot right in that spot. And every dot on here, I took, you know, the painting looked a lot like this last July, and then I've spent months just taking dots out and making the color brighter. So even though this painting was virtually done in July, it's not, because it needs this dot. Do you work on, do you prime the canvas or unprimed, or you just... I oh, know they're primed. They're all primed. They all have different things on them, actually. They're all so different, they're all done really differently. And recreating them would be probably impossible. Just because they really are no, different no, from different. each other. As a curator walking in, that is such an appeal. To have Thank each you. one be its own experience. And yet see the, the relationship to each other and the relationship to your work. I always say I'm going to quit and go work in a nursery and transplant geraniums in the country. And that's what I could do, and I'd be really happy doing it. And that's always my out. And I think everybody has some fantasy out. The garden had stuff to begin with, and I reorganized it and literally reshaped it. Clean it up back here and kind of let it be Jurassic. It was in a much more formal grid, and I, I ungridded it and moved all the boxwoods, and, and 
I'm trying to make it work in my own way. So in a way, it's really like my paintings. They're popping. Everything's popping. There's a lot of morning glories growing up in there, too. I know. I'm letting them go. I kind of into them. I love to use paint because it's really fun and it's really challenging. And it's really difficult. And color is really a trip. That said, to me, painting is a craft. It's what you do with it that matters. It's what you're saying with it that matters. I'm not sure you decide to be an artist. I think you are an artist or you're not an artist. It's really a calling. It's like being a nun or a priest. You just are. And then once you understand that that's really what it is, you're kind of stuck with it. But I think at some point you wake up and you go, oh, I really couldn't change my life even if I wanted to.